And so without further ado, this session on the city structure and city charter will be led by uh, Ryan Richardson from the city attorney's office. Go ahead. Good morning, uh, Council President. This is City Attorney Barbara Parker. I just wanted to state that this is a general overview that Chief Assistant City Attorney will be providing and that we we'll be, will be following up with more in-depth briefings for the council members. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay, I'm going to start my timer. I think I'm slated for roughly an hour. Um, hello, I'm Ryan Richardson. I'm a chief assistant city attorney in the Oakland City Attorney's Office. My pronouns are he, him, um, and I'm excited to be here. I, I am excited to be before our two new council members, and I look forward to meeting each of you in person. As the city attorney mentioned, we will be, uh, if we haven't already, reaching out to all the council members, but in particularly the new council members, to schedule um, private small group uh, discussions of any number of legal issues, including uh, charter structure and city overview. So I mentioned that to say that this, what we'll be discussing here today is, is really just intended to be an overview in the interest of time, um, but also in the interest of uh, making sure that we have a forum to answer your questions candidly, and and in a, in if there's if we need to do it in a privileged setting, that we can do that. And the reason that matters is just that um, there are folks out there that would sue the city and try to impede the city council and the city leaders from going about the business that they've been elected to do. And we don't want to say anything publicly that would give them tools to mount those uh, attacks on on the city. So. Um, if there are, I'll answer questions to the best of my ability today, but if there are questions that, that um, I'm not sure are appropriate to answer in public or that I know aren't appropriate to answer in public, please um, have patience with me and I will, I will take note of them and we'll discuss them in due time. Um, lastly and quickly, I did want to, again, I know the council president has thanked um, uh, Angela Robinson Pinon, but I wanted to thank her as well. And Nicole Nedich, uh, credit where credit is due, they put together the slides that I'll pre be presenting. So I, I wanted to make sure they got credit for that. Also wanted to credit um, SPUR, their 2021 report, Making Government Work, um, with recommendations for Oakland. Uh, a lot of the history that you'll see in the slides and that I'll be presenting, um, I think we drew from, from that report. So with that, um, Ready for the first slide. So just a brief overview of the, the history of Oakland and its and its city charter, which I think is, is helpful to understand kind of where we are today and understand why some of the rules that are in place, how they came to pass, how they how they evolved. Um, so Oakland was established as a charter city in uh, in 1852. Um, in 1931, uh, Oakland established what's called a council manager system of governance. And that, that persisted for, as you can see, for quite a long time until 1998. And what council manager system means is that there was a, uh, there was a city council and there was a, an appointed city manager and the city manager was solely and exclusively responsible for administering the day-to-day -day affairs of the city. Um, and under that structure, there was a mayor, but the mayor was essentially a, was the, the, the president of the council, was the, the presiding officer of the council, um, was not really an executive um, of the city, but, but a legislator. In 1998, um, this, the city's charter went through probably its, its biggest overhaul um, since 1931 and really to date. Uh, and that's when the city switched to a mayor council form of government governance. Um, as I'll explain a little bit later, that it was a move toward a strong mayor structure, and I'll explain what that means. Um, but there are some things that make Oakland unique um, from others, what we would describe as strong mayor um, structures in other cities in the country and in California. But in a nutshell, the, the mayor council form means that the, the mayor is directly elected and instead of being a council member, really leads the administration and that the, the council is a separate legislative body. Uh, in addition, in 1998, uh, we the, the, the city voters decided to change the charter to make the, the city attorney and the city auditor um, directly 
elected and also instituted a city administrator who is appointed by and, and serves at the pleasure of the mayor. Uh, that appointment is subject to council confirmation, but, but the mayor appoints the city administrator. Um, next slide, please. So um, in the coming slides, we're gonna go over the, the, the major uh, city officials or the highest profile city officials in the city. Um, many of which are elected, but some of which are appointed uh, and all of whom are, are uh, the ones that we'll discuss today are, are named in the city charter. Um, next slide, please. So we'll start with the mayor. Um, I think as we, most of us know, um, the mayor is elected for a four year term and oversees uh, the administrative or executive branch of the city government and does that largely through appointing and giving direction to the city administrator. Uh, and as I mentioned, when the, when the uh, mayor does appoint a city administrator, it's that appointment is subject to confirmation by the council. Um, I mentioned previously that when Oakland amended its charter in 1998, we moved toward what some would call a strong mayor structure. Um, and so traditionally, what a strong mayor structure is, it means that the, uh, the, the mayor themselves is largely the chief executive of the city directly. Um, so they're, they will direct department heads, the department heads report directly to the mayor in, in, a, in a typical strong mayor structure. And often a strong mayor will have a, a veto power in um, the legislative process or some sort of veto power in the legislative process. So Oakland um, is unique in a number of ways. So one is that here, the mayor doesn't does not direct um, does not direct city directors or other other staff directly for the most part, but rather again appoints the city administrator and um, gives direction that way. So it's it's less it's more indirect. Also in Oakland, um, the mayor does not have veto power over council legislation or council actions. Uh, for a while, between 1998 and, and 2004, uh, the charter did allow the mayor to suspend ordinances, newly passed ordinance, and send them back to council for a for reconsideration. And, and I believe that at that time, once it was sent back, it had to then be repassed by a, a supermajority. Uh, but that the voters withdrew that power in 2004. And as it stands now, the closest thing the mayor has to a veto in the charter is the um, the authority to break ties when there's a tie in, in uh, by the council on, the, on a council vote when it comes to resolutions and ordinances. Um, but there are some caveats to that. And there are some recent changes to that that came into effect with the passage of Measure X, which um, I'll get back to that later and we'll talk about more. Um, so uh, yeah, next slide, please. So uh, this is this is a kind of a short list and non-exhaustive list of, of some of the mayor's responsibilities under the charter. Uh, one of the big ones and one of the ones that um, our, our veteran council members are, are gearing up for and that our new council members are, will, will quickly be baptized in is, is the budget process and that begins um, typically with the mayor and the city administrator preparing a, a budget proposal and submitting that to the city council. And that often uh, the city council can then amend it from there. But that that proposal is often the one of, if not the um, springboard for discussing what the, the, the next budget, adopted budget will look like. Um, the mayors also can recommend uh, measures and legislation for the council to consider. Uh, so again, they don't vote on the council, but they, they do have the ability to uh, make their own proposals about where the, the city should be heading legislatively. Um, the mayor's also, uh, uh, just skipping ahead a little bit, uh, one of the mayor's um, more important duties is to appoint uh, most, of the mem most of the members, or the members for most of the boards and commissions in the city. The city has uh, um, dozens of uh, boards and commissions ranging from 
purely advisory boards and commissions to uh, boards and commissions that actually have some independent decision-making authority. And for, for most of those boards, and in some cases, maybe for some of the seats on those boards, uh, in other cases, for all of the seats on the board, the mayor uh, makes those appointments um, subject to, often subject to council confirmation. Um, so that is another um, kind of ongoing and major power of the city. And, and the mayor is, of course, the city's um, figurehead and, and um, representative when it comes to intergovernmental relations. And that's whether uh, between cities uh, at the state level and, and even um, with, with regard to our, our federal leadership, the, the mayors typically are representative um, and, and uh, speaks for the city in those relationships. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the city council. City council is, of course, the legislative body of the city, and it um, it's comprised of eight council members. So we have, of course, the um, seven district council members and one council member at large. And this is noteworthy because um, obviously Oakland has an even number of council members. Uh, and most major cities in California, even the ones that have an at-large council member have an odd total. So there's a number of cities that just have district council members, but they have an odd number of districts or a number of cities that have an even number of districts plus an at-large council members. But for the most part, you, you, you'll see that uh, other major cities in California, one way or another, end up with an odd number of council members. And um, of course, we know that that matters because when you have an odd number and everybody's participating, it's impossible for the vote to end in a tie. Whereas when we with an even number with full participation, it can end up in Oakland with a 4-4 tie. Um, I mentioned uh, a little while ago that they're in, in the charter and specifically in charter section 305, uh, there's a provision that allows the mayor to break a tie. So, uh, and I think obviously for the reasons discussed in Oakland, that's particularly important because we, that is, um, the, the odds of that happening is, is higher in Oakland than maybe in some other places. Uh, one thing I'll note is that with the passage of Measure X in November, the definition of what it, what it means for the council to uh, end for a council vote to end in a tie uh, has changed. So, and just to reiterate, this the the mayor's ability to break a tie only it applies to ordinances and resolutions. So the council can act uh, by ordinance, resolution, or by motion. And what I'm discussing now applies to ordinances and resolution, or what we might kind of term as as legislation. But previously the rule was that there was only a tie if there was an equal number of yes votes and no votes. Uh, and what that meant was, so as an example, if there were, if all eight council members were at a meeting uh, and four council members voted yes and three, four voted no, that was a tie. But if four voted yes and three voted no and one person abstained, uh, or was excused for that vote or something along those lines, then it was not considered a tie. It, had, it was 4-3. Uh, Measure X changed that, and it, it will. it's going to be interesting, I think, to see uh, the degree to which that results in more mayoral participation in, in council votes. But what Measure X says is that uh, if, there, if a council member is absent or abstains from a vote, then that counts as a no vote. So in the example I just gave, where you had three yeses, three noes, and one abstention under Measure X, that would be considered a tie because the abstention would count as a no. And so you would have a 4-4 four, four tie uh, and the mayor would, would be entitled to, to weigh in and break that tie in one direction or another. And I'll talk um, a little bit more later on about what the votes that are required generally for the passage of, of various types of city council actions. Um, so as we know, the council members serve four year terms um, and uh, each year the council members, as we just went through earlier this week, elect a president uh, among its members and a president pro tem. These two provisions also um, 
were recently amended by Measure X. So uh, one of the things Measure X did was institute term limits for council members. Um, another thing Measure X did was uh, there used to be a distinction. There used to be a council president, a, a vice mayor who would serve as uh, the mayor in, 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 if the mayor were unavailable, and a president pro tem who would be the kind of the the vice vice president to the president of the council. Uh, Major X did away with, with those three categories and kind of boiled it down to two. So currently now, as it stands, the president of the council is also the person who would fill in for the mayor in the mayor, if the mayor were unavail unavailable and the president pro tem in turn fill in for the president of the council if the president's unavailable. So a, a bit more simple uh, than the, the previous structure, I think. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the, what are the city council's um, roles generally? Obviously, the, the city council serves as the, the governing body for the city. So um, obviously passing legislation, uh, fleshing out and amending our municipal code uh, in terms of, of uh, codes that folks have to follow in terms of anything from, from building codes to public safety codes to our sunshine ordinances, all of it is, is subject to council approval and amendment. Um, but also, I mean, I guess slightly distinct from that is, is setting city policy and giving general direction to the city administrator and the mayor. So aside from kind of setting the, the laws for the, the residents of Oakland, local laws for the residents of Oakland, city council also it gives direction to the city staff, uh, but through through its its policy making authority and through the city administrator and the mayor. So um, that will often come in the form of resolutions, or even I think as as was briefly mentioned earlier uh, by council kind of policy budget directives and budget priorities. Those types of things are are policy directions. Um, the council votes on ordinances and resolutions. Those are two of the three ways that the council can take action. The third is, is by motion. Um, but ordinances and resolutions are uh, distinct in, in, in a number of ways. We, we generally consider those to be legislation. And one thing to, to note about ordinances and resolutions is that they require five votes to pass. Five, five council members must there must be five votes in order for a ordinance or resolution to pass. And that's regardless of how many council members are present uh, or, or voting. So for example, um, a quorum of the council, meaning, a, meaning the minimum number of council members that, that we would need to, to, to start a, a meeting is five under the charter section 209. So you could have a situation where we are rightfully having a meeting with, with five council members in attendance. And in that meeting, uh, if there was the body was voting on a motion, say a scheduling motion or a motion to accept a informational report or something along those lines um, as distinct from a resolution or an ordinance, and everybody was voting on that motion, it could pass with, with three votes because that would be a majority of the folks voting and present. You could have three people vote in favor of the motion, two against, and it would pass. Uh, an ordinance or resolution is is different in that it re it require it in that would we'll use that scenario where you only have five council members because as I discussed the ordinance or resolution requires five votes to pass uh, that means in that scenario where you you just have a quorum all five of those council members would have to vote in favor of the ordinance or the resolution for it to pass if the vote ended four to one the ordinance or the resolution the action would fail. Um, and what this essentially does is um, it ensures that in that scenario, you, you don't end up with a situation where a very small minority of council members are passing legislation that, that if all the council members were present in voting, might not otherwise pass. Um, and it, it is with regard to ordinances and resolutions, again, where the mayor's tie-breaking authority comes in. So you can see now mathematically how that starts to play out, that if you have the four, four tie and the mayor comes in to break the tie, if the mayor votes in favor of the ordinance or resolution, you would then have the five votes necessary for that ordinance or resolution to pass. 
Uh, the city council also adopts the city budget. Um, the the most of the work that the the lion's share of the work is done on a on a biennial basis every two years, and uh, that's the cycle that we're we're coming into now. But it is revisited annually, so there is a mid what we call a mid cycle budget budget amendment. So in the in the off years, even though we have our two year budget, we will still revisit it in the middle of that two year period to make sure everything is um, still on track from a finance perspective, from our revenue projections and things like that, and also a spending perspective for the council to excuse me to adjust its priorities and to move uh, money around. And lastly, the council serves as um, the, the, the legacy board of di directors from um, the city's redevelopment agency days. Um, next slide, please. Okay, city attorney. So this, the city attorney in the city of Oakland is an elected position and it's a four year term. Not not every city attorney in California or in the country is elected. Um, there's many cities where the city attorney is appointed, typically by the governing body or the legislative body. In fact, in Oakland, that used to be the case. So before, again, that major charter overhaul in 1998, the city attorney in Oakland was appointed by the city council and could in turn be removed by the city council and replaced by the city council. Uh, and as I was looking into the history of that charter amendment and kind of the arguments in favor, uh, the, my understanding is that that charter amendment in 1998 was born out of a concern that if the city attorney were giving advice that the council didn't like or took an action that the city council didn't like, even if that advice were the right advice or that action was the right action, that the city attorney could face removal and that that uh, could have a... Um, a, a, a negative effect, the, the effect of kind of dissuading the city attorney from, from giving their earnest uh, advice or taking the, the best course of action in a given situation. And so this was the election process was intended to make the city attorney a bit more independent, I guess, similar to a, um, not exactly like a judge, but along the same lines of why judges might be elected, not for them to be politicians, but for them to be independent. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a list of some of the city attorney's duties, and, and those are mostly found in Charter Section 4016. Uh, and, and most of them are what I think one would expect uh, this, the duties of the city attorney to be, and that's to provide legal, legal services, advice, and representation to elected officials. Uh, that includes the city administ administrator, uh, and as well as boards, commissions, and other agencies for the city. We, um, the charter says to draft ordinances and resolutions, that, that's often our role. It, it is also sometimes our role that, the, you know, the, in the case of council members, that the council members themselves and their um, staff will take the first um, stab at drafting a resolution or an ordinance. Uh, and that we'll, our office will conduct a review and, and review it for form and legality and make sure that and provide feedback on maybe how to tighten it up and make it more understandable, more defensible, those types of things. Uh, the same is true of contracts where it often, most typically the co contracts are in the first instance negotiated and drafted by city staff and our office reviews them for form and legality and revises them as necessary. But in all those cases, ordinances and resolutions and contracts uh, and other legal documents, ultimately our office needs to sign off on the document, again, as to form and the legality. And what I mean by that is um, not that it's, again, not our place to uh, weigh in as to whether we think from a policy perspective or a cost perspective or an efficiency pers per perspective, it, the ordinance or resolution is good or bad or a good idea. We're, we're really looking at it to advise on whether it's on solid legal ground. Um, and then, you know, one of our biggest jobs in the city attorney's office, uh, kind of, as I mentioned in the beginning of the, uh, of the presentation is to defend the city, to make sure that we're uh, looking forward to, I think in the first instance, defending the city means um, 
mitigating the risk that the city will get sued. But when the city does get sued, it's our duty to defend the city against against those claims and lawsuits. Under Charter Section 4016, the city attorney needs the city council's authorization to settle or dismiss litigation. There, the council has delegated, officially delegated to the city attorney some authority for the city attorney to settle smaller cases without constantly going back to council for authority. But for, for the most part, and always for larger cases where there's more exposure for the city, the city attorney needs to go to the city council to update them on the facts of the case, the city's exposure, if any, and to get direction from the city council in terms of where to go with the case, um, whether to settle or dismiss it or go to trial or what have you. Um, and that typically happens, will happen in closed session. So, and it, this is, this gets a little bit into the, the Brown Act and our Sunshine Ordinance, but that's essentially the, the you know, the two, two ways that the council can meet open session, which we're doing now and closed session, which often is for the purposes of getting direction on uh, claims and lawsuits. So the, the city attorney will get the direction of the council's goal for the claims and lawsuit. And then it's the city attorney's job to figure out what specific strategies to use to achieve that goal. So what specific motions to file, what specific arguments to make, what specific approach to take in negotiations, those types of tactics are up to the city attorney. But the, the overall goal, how the, the city wants this lawsuit to end and what we're striving to do comes from the city council. Uh, and then the city attorney can initiate lawsuits. Uh, some, sometimes the case that um, the, the, the city is the plaintiff and that the city needs to do something in, uh, typically in court to protect or enforce its rights. And that's also the, the city attorney's purview to do that. Those can come about in, in one of two ways. The, the city under charter section 4016, the city attorney can initiate the lawsuit um, kind of independently and then seek council uh, ratification after the fact. Um, but also can, if, if time permits, go to the council ahead of time and get direction from the council about whether or not to initiate um, litigation. And again, that, that process will typically happen in closed session. Um, next slide, please. Before you go on, Ryan, I just wanted to add about the initiation of lawsuits, and we can discuss this more in the briefings. The city attorney also has independent authority under state law to bring certain kinds of suits on behalf of the people of the state of California. One example is public nuisance actions. That's just to give you that sort of broader authority in some context. Thank you. Um, okay, so the city auditor, uh, city auditor, like um, the, our other elected officials, is elected for a four-year term. Um, and as most of us know, the, the various city officials, the, the charter tries to kind of split them up into two groups, so that every every two years, roughly half of our city officials are there's an election in roughly half of our city official offices. Um, and the city auditor is 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 their job is to help ensure that the city is running um, efficiently and effectively um, and to deter fraud, waste, and abuse, which I'll talk about a little bit more, I believe, in the next slide. So we can go to that. So uh, the, the city auditor's duties, I believe they're, they're lar largely found in Charter Section 403. Um, and some of them are listed here, but there are a, a number of other powers and duties that this, the auditor has, but these are some of the main ones. Um, one of them is to, to, as the name obviously uh, indicates, to perform um, audits of, of the city, financial audits, but there's also performance audits that the, um, that the city auditor conducts. So to see if, if city mo money is being well spent, um, but also to see if city operations are running efficiently and running the way they should. Those are um, at least in my understanding that kind of the two types of main types of audits that the city auditor conducts. Uh, and 
I think what, one of the things we I didn't list here, but but as we mentioned in the last slide, and I know this is one of the things that the auditor's office historically and, and our current city auditor takes very seriously is is evaluating um, the city's inc- internal controls to safeguard city resources against not just against inefficiency, but against specifically like fraud, waste, and abuse. So um, the city auditor has a a hotline and a and a, whole, and a specific process for receiving complaints from from whistleblowers and outside parties but also you know they have their own processes for looking for potential fraud waste and abuse and and investigating those uh, and making sure that we that it's addressed um, timely where where it's occurring the city auditor also prepares impartial financial analyses of all ballot measures and proposed major expenditures this is um just reminds me of one of the other duties that the city attorney has. So when we talk about ballot measures, the city council um, may pat, may put something on the ballot by its own resolution or the voters by collecting enough signatures through an initiative process can put something on the ballot. But in both cases, there needs to be prepared uh, an impartial legal analysis and an impartial financial analysis. So what are the legal implications of this ballot measure? That's the, uh, the city attorney's job typically. Um, unless the ballot measure would impact the city attorney's office, in which case we'll ask another city attorney's office to prepare it. And similarly, for what it, what are the financial impacts of this ballot measure, the city auditor's office will prepare that, unless the ballot measure in, will impact the city auditor's office in a financially or in, in some other way, in which case the city auditor will ask some other city, the, the auditor of some other city to prepare that analysis. Um, but we okay. We did have performance audits in here. So, and then finally, um, the city auditor provides assistance to city departments to improve their effectiveness. So, I think that you know what I think what the city auditor would say is that the goal of the audits uh, is is really the the recommendations that come at the end, um, and how do we how do we improve city processes. Going back to Measure X real quickly, another um, there's a number of significant changes that Measure X will make. One of them, uh, among them, is the fact that uh, it, there's now minimum staffing for the city auditor's office. For and again, this is not the exhaustive list of the city auditor's duties, but the, under Measure X, the city auditor uh, has to be budgeted for at least 14 full-time, the equivalent of 14 employees annually. And, and let with with certain exceptions for you know if the city's in an extreme um, financial hardship, but generally speaking, uh, there's there's now minimum staffing for the city auditor's office. So it will be, I think, interesting to see what impact that has on the the, the number of audits and the city auditor's ability to discharge this really long list of duties that that the office has. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, you know, the city clerk is among our um, most important and highest profile city officials, but uh, notably the city clerk is not elected. The city clerk is appointed by the city administrator uh, and confirmed by the city council. And next, next slide, please. And among the city clerk's duties are to, they're the, they're the city's official record keeper when it comes to council actions, I think is maybe the easiest way to think of it. But, but if we break that down, we're, we're talking about ordinances, resolutions, motions, and then the minutes of the discussions that happen at the meetings where those ordinances, resolutions, and motions are, are passed or, or, the, or they don't pass. So they're the city's official record keeper, particularly for legislative records. Um, the, the city clerk is um, kind of at the center also just of the city's um, public records duties and efforts generally. Uh, they, they are a lot of the city records retention policy is largely um, managed by and overseen by the city clerk's office. The archiving of city records and, and the contracts for making sure that it we're archiving properly are managed with the city clerk's office. The 
Uh, the city's contract for making sure that our our new legislation is posted on muni code and that they're they're staying on top of of publishing our new ordinances and things like that are all managed through the city clerk's office so that's that's kind of the the backwards looking record keeping and then the the city clerk um just day to day week in week out is responsible for facilitating forward-looking the legislative process. So helping the council and staff um, prepare for meetings, prepare for posting the agendas, getting the information, uh, titles, documentation, agenda materials in on time, and then uh, reviewing them, catching catching problems, in, um, you know, week in and week out, catching issues and bringing them to our office's attention or to staff's attention. And, and then once everything's in order, making sure that those materials are posted and published accordingly, always in conformance with the Brown Act and Sunshine, but often there are specific requirements in the charter or in state code that require us to, for instance, publish things in a newspaper for a certain number of days before it's considered a council and things like that. And the, the clerk is responsible for uh, making sure all of that happens uh, week in and week out. And then the, the clerk is uh, the city's um, elections official. So uh, helping making sure the city complies with uh, its duties in, in, in conducting elections, in calling elections, uh, assisting candidates as they, when they want to get their name uh, on the ballot, ex- assisting uh, voters who are who put together initiatives to put uh, to put a measure on the ballot themselves from the kind of the initial process of, of their notice of intent to to start an initiative to gathering their, to actually counting the signatures at the end of the day and, and certifying that um, it's ready to be placed on the ballot. The, and then also the clerk's office is responsible post-election for making sure that uh, we get the certifications from the county and that they're brought to the to the um, the council for for uh, declarations of winners and things like that. And so inevitably every every time there's an election cycle, um, there's new issues that come up and we're, our office is working closely with the clerk to, to navigate those. And then as as everyone here uh, or everyone, all of the members of the council knows, the clerk is responsible for administering the official oaths of office to our elected officials. Um, next slide. Okay, so and it coming back to the city administrator, we talked uh, a little bit about how the the, the, mayor, the mayor in Oakland is not a uh, traditional strong mayor in the sense that that we don't have department heads and program managers reporting directly to the mayor for the most part. Instead, we have those folks reporting to the city administrator who in turn reports to the mayor. So uh, we talked a little bit about one of the mayor's powers is to appoint the city administrator. But it's it's really the city administrator that's responsible for the the day to day administrative and fiscal operations of the city. So the, uh, the typically the f- the first place a department head would go to to get direction to get approval for something is either to the city administrator or in in off in some cases the city administrator's designees, an assistant city administrator, uh, who may be kind of the liaison for that department. But the city administrator's office and the city administrator are ultimately responsible for the day-to-day management of city affairs and administration of city affairs. Uh, but of course, the city administration, a uh, city administrator is going to receive, can receive direction, what like kind of big picture policy directives or um, more targeted directions from the mayor. And as we mentioned, can receive policy directions from the city council. So the, the council may task the city administrator with achieving some policy goal. The, the day-to-day details of going about navigating that and how to achieve that goal are going to be up to the, the city administrator and the mayor. So, and, and so just, again, just final note on kind of the strong mayor thing. Uh, uh, in, in San Francisco, for example, what their charter says is that the, the, the mayor directly has direct oversight of all administrative departments. Um, 
Here, it's the city administrator that has that direct oversight of the of administrative departments. And I believe, yeah, and we've covered the rest of this. So this, the city administrator does, however, take direction from the mayor. So they're they're kind of work in tandem as a team to to provide that administrative direction to our departments. Next slide, please. So the city administrator uh, has a duty to the council to enforce its laws, uh, including its, its ordinances and to enforce its policies and, and not just enforce them, but to administer them um, and to see to it that they're, that they're understandable and that um, you know, often issue regulations or FAQs and those types of things. Uh, the city administrator as, as the chief executive officer is often going to have insights into what will kind of operationally work, what's advisable and what's not, and therefore is, is in a position to make recommendations to the city council about city affairs. We'll, we'll see this in the budget process, but, but um, across the board, public safety ordinances, building and safety um, legislation, the city administrator will have recommendations. They are, they are the city's chief financial officer in the sense that they're tasked with managing the city's financial affairs in conjunction with the uh, largely, I think, working with the city's director of finance. And they, as we mentioned, the, the city administrator helps the mayor in preparing a budget proposal for the council. Um, and in addition to, to policies, the city enforcing policies, the city administrator oversees city projects so that when, if there's a development projects, homelessness intervention projects, um, uh, macro things like that. That the it's the city administrator who would typically be tasked with standing those projects up, getting them up and running, getting them staffed. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, and this is this is. I'll just reiterate. This really is an overview. Um, the kind of the the council administrative relations and where where some of the lines are drawn between you know council authority and city administrative authority uh it is very fact dependent it's there's even on our website and this will be covered in our in uh, the briefing that we give this city council members uh there's dozens of public legal opinions on the city attorney's website and many of which speak to these issues specifically and, and really what it comes down to is there's no bright line sometimes between um, the city administrator's role and the city council's role. And that's to be expected because we don't want to have gaps in, in our safety net for, for city residents and city services. Um, but sometimes it, it can be hard to see where that gap is, but where that line is drawn. But generally speaking, um, the city council, as we discussed, acts via the ordinance resolution or motion and gives and in that way gives direction to the city administrator. Um, it's through those policy directives and legal directives. But what the charter says is that the city council does not have administrative authority and can't interfere with administrative affairs. So um, one of the things that that definitely means um, when we talk about interference in uh, administrative affairs is typically especially individual council members, the idea is to go through the city administrator for questions and feedback um, and coordination on administrative affairs, on, on administrative questions and issues, as opposed to going directly to staff um, and you know trying to get answers from staff or, or set the staff to some task or get a report back from staff. It's, it's always safer to go to the city administrator. Um, and it, but it also means once this, the city council has given a policy directive or a, a broader policy directive that the, the administration of that, carrying out that directive, directing which employees to do what in furtherance of that policy directive or to achieve the goal or finish the project is really up to the city administrator. Uh, and then oh, I think we're on our last slide and that should leave us a little bit of time for, um, Question. So if we we'll go to the next slide, let's see. Yeah. Next slide, please. 
So, um, and this slide, I think, is is just kind of a uh, a pre a little bit of a discussion on how the city administrator goes about keeping track of the various policy directives that, that the city council has given it. Uh, so one of the ways is um, on the city's website, but I'm also aware that the city um, clerk's office and folks in the city administrator's office are um, well on their way to working with uh, Legistar to use some of its additional functionality that it has to not only allow the city to track our agendas and our legislation and, and agenda materials, but also to um, to track directives that come from the, the city council via legislation or motion, so to, to, to track their progress after they've been passed. Um, and see, and, and then I'm just generally aware that the city administration is working on other protocols, to, I think, to better work with the city, the city council in um again tracking those those priorities and and also i believe uh, um prioritizing because it's one thing i think to have an exhaustive list of every all the outstanding directives from the city council it's another thing to know realistically we may all be in agreement we can't achieve all of these in the near term it's another thing to know which of these are the priorities which of these should does the council want staff working on before the others um so with that, I will um, invite questions or, and then if I, if there's anything that I missed, uh, I don't know if, if city attorney Parker wants to add anything, um, I'd invite others to, to add anything that they'd like to add as well. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Richardson, really appreciate it. So we have um, about 15 minutes for questions and a little bit of discussion if needed. I do want to make sure that the new council members, as well as the newer council members, um, have space here to ask questions. So feel free to raise your hand. And if your hand is up, I will call on the newer council members first. And Madam I President, can I just uh, provide one clarification before yes. I proceed? Um, and it's with respect to the 1998 Charter Amendment that was discussed that reformed the city in many ways. The city auditor was already elected at that time. And it's something we have to dig deep to find, but that's been elected for many, many years and was not amended with Measure X and the strong layer. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, before I start calling on the council members, um, I do want to note that I uh, would appreciate city administrator Riskin um, sharing a little bit on this last slide about some of the protocols that we have in place. Perhaps not right now, maybe we'll hear from the council members first and collect all the questions, but I think it would be helpful, um, especially given the non-interference in administrative affairs. Um, it would be helpful to hear from the administrator about how we conduct our business. Um, so the reason that I wanted to add this slide was precisely because of the, the issues that were we're discussing and because um as mr richardson said that the charter provides kind of a framework and some guardrails um but not necessarily bright lines and i know you know this is a unique form of government it's not a council manager form it's not a strong mayor it's something in between and i know that this has been you know frankly an issue of, of tension or, or confusion in terms of uh, who has responsibility for what and, and though the council doesn't have administrative authority under the charter, I understand as the council president just said that you are responding to your constituents, to, to their questions, to their concerns, to their demands. Uh, you are developing policy that you wanna see implemented. Um, so I, I don't want uh, the administration to be kind of using a charter as a way to block uh, your ability to do your job effectively. So the, the reason that I, that was the reason I wanted to add this slide that, um, you know, first of all, in terms of uh, council policy directives, there are a lot of them. Um, and I don't think we have historically uh, on the administration side that done a good job of tracking them. Uh, so we have uh, been updating based on the last budget cycle and we'll be updating on our website uh, the status of those, and we'll endeavor to keep them updated on an ongoing basis so that you can see how we are managing uh, 
the, or the status of the directives that you have created during the budget process. And as Mr. Richards had mentioned, um, that, you know, those are just the budget policy directives, but every time you, or most times when you enact legislation, whether via ordinance or resolution, and additionally by motion, you're providing direction to us to do something. And sometimes every resolved clause has a, a different task for us to do, and we have not been systematically tracking those. Departments go off and, and execute based on that council direction, but we haven't had a good accountable way to do that tracking. So we have been uh, looking at how we can use our existing Legistar system uh, to better, better daylight all of that so that everybody, the public, the council, the administration uh, can see the status uh, or at least can see the list of all that, all those directions that have come from the city council and that accountability will they can help everybody. It will, as Mr. Richardson suggested, suggested, beg the question at some point of prioritization, because there's generally more direction given than the administration has the capacity to respond to, at least within a within certain timelines. So uh, I think it will help create a conversation where we can help prioritize those things and help hopefully better at the front end of council direction. Um, set some expectations or understanding of administrative capacity or reprioritization that is needed. Um, so in terms of the protocols, we had developed um, that um, the, the charter kind of says what you, what you can't do in terms of administrative interference. There's an administrative policy that elaborates further on that. But last year or two years ago now, we developed a draft set of protocols to try to facilitate uh, the kinds of interactions such as both council members called and Bass made reference to in terms of how, how better can council members and their staff interact with the administration. We presented that at a public meeting, I think it was back in February of 2021. It was kind of a a retreat, kind of like this. It was an all-day session. That was one of the items on the agenda. We presented that for kind of review and feedback. Uh, I don't think we got a whole lot of feedback at that time, uh, but I think it it's a good starting point. That's something that you know from the discussion today we can refine and, and resubmit to the council for its consideration. In in short. Um, I think there is not a problem. You know, there are many channels, uh, 311 being one, there are many channels uh, to uh, request service or information from the city. Um, I don't interpret the charter as preventing city council members or staff from engaging directly with city administration staff for, for purpose of inquiry or information gathering. Um, if, an inc if a request is something that is going to be substantial and request time and effort from the person responding, um, that's something that's bet better to go through the city administrator's office. But it's as, if it's a simple, what's the status of the, the tree down on Skyline Boulevard? Um, I think that those kind of direct inquiries are, are fine and better done in a, in a direct basis. What we did propose in the communication protocol was that for anything that's that's more substantial or significant that you uh, at least include in the correspondence, e either directly come through our office or at least include us on the correspondence because uh, we can't track the responsiveness of city departments to council member requests if, if we don't have any visibility into them. And that was really one of the core things that we were seeking to establish in that protocol. Um, also encouraging, and I know many of you do this, that if you have uh, an interest area of your own from a policy standpoint or of your constituents from a service standpoint um, relative to any number of departments that you meet regularly with those departments. And I know, again, a number of you do that. You have regular meetings with some departments. Uh, you're not making policy or providing direction. You're just exchanging information and making sure the department leadership is aware of issues and concerns in your district. And I think that is fine as well. So we can, we will make an effort to refresh those protocols and resubmit them to you for your consideration. Uh, I wanna make sure that uh, we don't have 
walls between the council and the administration, uh, but that we do our best to enhance working together. And as I noted in the last bullet, you know, I have offered and the offer stands and, and I do with uh, pretty much everyone on the call to meet regularly with, uh, with each elected official. Um, and I know others and on my staff, and as I said, other departments do so as well. That kind of communication exchange is often one of the best ways for us to figure out how we can work together. Uh, all that said, I, I'm open to uh, other suggestions or things that you think we and, and my successor and our, and our successors can be doing differently. Um, so that, that's what I have to say on this, and I can speak to Councilmember Guy's questions uh, whenever you deem appropriate, Madam President.